Welcome to The Third Story. I'm Leo Sidrin. That swinging music that you hear behind me is the sound of drummer Jochen Rukert's latest release, an organ quartet record called Stars and Garters. I think the best way to set you up for today's conversation is to simply read you the correspondence that preceded it. Here's an email I received from Jochen earlier this summer. Hey Leo, you're probably at home thinking, why has Jochen not pestered me about my extremely popular podcast thing with his totally unfitting music? What am I, chopped liver? Well, that is over now. I had a somewhat big release in February with my electronic project. I've been doing it for years. Is that something you might be interested in? Hope you're having a pleasant pandemic so far. Jochen Ruckert. My response. Jochen, I have tried to take as long as possible to respond to you, but could not last longer than 13 days, so please forgive my unnecessarily prompt reply to your email. I would love to talk to you for the podcast, not only about your electronic project, but also about that time you got stuck trying to fly to Russia. Jochen then sent me links to download many of his solo records. He made his first one in his early 20s, and it featured Chris Potter and Kurt Rosenwinkel, among others. Eventually, he started composing his own material, and he's made a series of records in recent years featuring his own tunes. The latest, Stars and Garters, which we're listening to right now, came out earlier this year. He also sent me links to his electronic music project called Wolf Parkinson White. The most recent release, Favors, also came out earlier this year and features collaborations with some of Jochen's singer friends, including Josh Meese, Becca Stevens, Claire Manchon, and Nora Jones, among many others. So that was nice, to listen to his oeuvre, to crawl inside his skin, to swing with Jochen for a couple of days. But the real discovery for me was his ebooks, a series of professional and personal anecdotes that Jochen has written and self published under the heading Read the Rukert. I read the most recent installment, Volume 4, which I think probably came out about four or five years ago, and it was incredible. I was laughing all day. Such a pleasure. It is insidery, it's a parsing of the minutiae of the jazz life, but man, is it funny, and it's accompanied by a series of selfie photos that he's taken in various hotel rooms around the world. I think that's all you need to know from me when it comes to Jochen. He's a total character. He says what he thinks. He was born in Germany, but at this point he spent more time in New York than he ever did in Germany. I think he has a pretty unusual backstory and a totally unique disposition. A few notes, though, before we dive in. Number one, this is a long one. Deal with it. It's 2020. Everything's upside down. Pandemic, economic collapse, long episodes with jazz drummers. Everything goes. Also, after keeping a super regular schedule this year and managing to put out an episode nearly every week, I realized that it has been a minute since my last episode. And again, I remind you, it's 2020. Time is an illusion, and clearly any sense of normalcy is out the window. Why should this podcast be any different? Third-Story.com is the place to go. Find previous episodes with friends and collaborators of Jochen Rukerts, as well as some of the people we discussed in this episode, including drummer Bill Stewart, guitarist Lage Lund, singer-songwriters Jesse Harris and Becca Stevens, and many, many, many others. And while you're at the website, you can check out the Spotify playlist that I curated for this episode and see some videos of Jochen as well. Finally, a shout out to my man, Luigi Santosuoso, who is using the Third Story podcast as motivation to exercise in these COVID days. You too can listen to these episodes while working out. I will allow it. Without further preamble, Vorwort or Einleitung, here's my conversation with Jochen Rukert. There we go. You got me? Something's happening. And now I got you. I got you too. Oh my God, you have such a pro mic. Look at that. Holy shit. Well, yours is kind of pro. Hey, thanks for letting me do this. Thank you for suggesting that we do this. I don't want to jinx us, but (laughs) sometimes people suggest that I talk to them and even if they're like musically it's right, I wonder if it's going to be an interesting conversation. And when I read your volume four, I guess, of your ebook series yesterday, I was uh-huh. literally on the floor laughing. <laughs> I mean, there was no way for me to explain to my wife and daughter why 
I was experiencing what I was experiencing, but the shit was just so funny. Well, it's it's uh, musicians only, you know. It's uh, all the jokes, uh, all the stuff that's happening is so. It's it's some stuff that just happens only to musicians, and that's why it's so funny only to you and me, you know, and not your wife. I don't know if your wife's a musician. I have no idea. She's not. She's not, not a musician, and she <laughs> and she really doesn't find it to be that funny. I think probably, but. <laughs> Before we get too far into this, yoke, and I have to say, I don't think I've ever said your last name. Okay, here, I, go, here it goes. Let's hear it. In Germany, people would address me as Jochen Rückert. Uh-huh. But since I moved to the States, uh, I've just gone with whatever the first guy at immigration called me, which was Jochen. So I'm Jochen now. Yep. And last name is Rückert instead of Rückert. So actually, last name is pretty close. Rukert. Rukert with, with an American R. That's what I've come to call myself, which is kind of silly. Is it strange to have to call yourself by a name that really doesn't belong to you? Well, I've been in the States longer than I've lived in Germany now. So it's, I'm used to it. But like sometimes my mom or something, what the, can I curse? Please. Yeah, my mom would be like, what the gosh darn hell, yeah. son? <laughs> I've just come to Americanize it because it'll be butchered anyway. So, and I, you know, it's not like I'm so proud of my amazing German heritage. <laughs> so, you know, or you know, those guys that always pronounce uh, like Spanish words really well, like when they go order food. You know, I don't really want to be that. And it's like that switch that you have to switch when you're talking. I can't really do it so fast. It's such a question. I have that issue myself because I, I pride myself on speaking good Spanish and then I'm like, you know, in a situation where you'd want to use your good Spanish when you can, but on the other hand, Ugh. do you really need to like dig in when you're ordering Mexican food and like really yeah. put the good accent in? Well, so you said that sometimes your mom thinks it's crazy the way you say your own name. Well, that's just a, a symptom of a larger question that I imagine your family and some of your friends when you were growing up might ask, which is like, what happened to Jochen? Where did he go? And is he ever coming back? You know, I, when I left, I was barely like 18, 19. So I, I didn't really have that many like very serious friends, you know, like there was not like I left behind these, like, there's like maybe one buddy I kind of studied with who was a fellow drummer that I'm still friends with. But uh, apart from that, you know, I, I was still making friends. So it wasn't like such a big jump. And I don't think there's a whole lot of people uh, sitting around Germany wondering where, where I've went because cause, uh, I really didn't start getting any attention till I was here, you know, like in my 20s. So I think most Germans know me as that drummer who was in New York, but who grew up in Germany. Do you feel that you are considered to be a German musician in Germany? Do they, they, they see you as, as German? Yeah, I mean, it's complicated because I, I do get, yes, in a way, yes. And it's, it's weird how it works if I work, you know, as a, if I, because, you know, I book gigs and stuff. So when I obviously get more gigs in Germany because I am German, mm -hmm. which makes no sense because I'm not in Germany and there's not much that connects me to Germany. So it's, it's a very strange thing. I don't really know what they think. In a way, I am yeah not very German, I guess. Does the language help? Do you think just being able to book in German and reach out to, to agents and clubs and whatever? Yeah, I mean, yes and no. You know, they are excited about New York, obviously, um, I might get more gigs because I'm German, but also because I live in New York and I bring a New York band, you know? Yeah. So it helps and it doesn't help. It's kind of like the thing, it helps on a certain level, you know, like the lower level, like the local level, but that's not really what, I, what I'm going for. You know? I'm not a local musician, so um, it gets complicated. That's, and I'm kind of like in between all, I don't know, would you, how would you say this in, in English? In, in German, we have this idiom that says, like, you're sitting, like, not really on any, you're just sitting in between chairs. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not really a German guy, but I'm not really an American guy to them either. So I don't really get, like, the, say, higher fees that are associated with a foreign band or an American band. But I also don't really get the local treatment. I get, like, the, the worst from both worlds. <laughs> <laughs> no dinner, no hotel, uh, but also paid like a local band. Yeah, exactly. But I have to fly. 
have to fly four people there. <laughs> well, so that's one of the things I loved about Read the Rukert, I guess it's called. Read the Rukert Volume yeah. 4. That's, that's the one I read. <laughs> In reading that from an outside perspective, I thought, who would possibly read this and think to themselves, you know what? I think I want to be a jazz musician, too. <laughs> That's the point of those books, I guess. I mean, it's really just I'm, I'm just complaining, right? I'm, I'm just complaining in book form, um, which now, I mean, with, with the pandemic, is very weird to think. I mean, I've been trying to write a little bit more on the next one. It's just so weird that I'm complaining about travel yeah the coffee quality at the airport or something you know in a way it makes complaining about travel almost seem charming and somewhat removed because we don't have the opportunity even to travel and suffer in that way but i mean i do think that there's something very powerful and poignant about reading all of the travails and struggles of getting stuck in haiti for example and then you know <laughs> trying to fly to switzerland and showing up ultimately at a gig where nobody's there you know you, you you finally get there you know you you spent all your money out of pocket and you show up late to a gig or you you know you're stuck in a foreign country and you're trying to get there as as hard as you can and you're suffering and it, you know you're really paying your dues and then you show up and nobody's at the gig i think people don't really understand how much effort it is to be a traveling jazz musician you know it's a lot of pain and um, it's a lot of work it's a lot of pain it's not much money to be made. And there's a lot of things that just keep happening over and over and over and over. I started writing this book out of, for two reasons. A, I was getting tired of like very uninformed, you know, like the kind of people that, that ask you after the gig if you were, how much of the, the music was composed and how much was improvised, that kind of thing. Um, that level of uninformedness, you know, when they go like, oh, it must be so nice to be a traveling musician you get to see all these places um and so i just wanted to you know write this little series to make clear that so we actually don't get to i don't really get to see anything you know when i travel to whatever rome oh beautiful city i see the airport a restaurant jazz club and a hotel that's it you know i don't really get to see anything so a it was that and then b it was just like me and my friend hayden Chisholm, who I've been in a band with like for a long, 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 long time. We always had these running jokes about, you know, some silly thing that would happen. And we would like uh, think about how it's, you know, some guy with like white guy with dreadlocks is going to come up and ask you to, to if you could sample a bar for his hip hop project or yeah. something. You know? yeah. <laughs> or, or, you know, some silly stuff like that. It's just, that just keeps happening over and over. So, that's kind of how this, the, this book series started, which is sort of, yeah, just recording these, these things that just keep happening um, over and over. That all the musicians, like most musicians are very familiar with this, with all the stuff that happens. Um, and uh, yeah, non-musicians would just never expect it, that that's how it actually is. There, there are a couple of moments also, though, in which you really allow yourself to be totally honest and vulnerable whether or not it's like your complete panic about not sitting in a window seat on an airplane and having to admit that to a fellow band member who seems very clearly to be Mark Turner to me, but I'm not, <laughs> you're not going to say his name, but, uh, yeah. um, or like even, you know, you get stranded in a hotel outside of Barcelona because your flight's canceled and, and you allow yourself to admit in this book, maybe because you think not that many people are going to read it and maybe even your wife's not going to read it, but you think, <laughs> well, maybe there'll be Swedish twins that are in this hotel with me and maybe they'll get into me and maybe I'll have a little tryst with some like hot Swedish girls while I'm stuck in this hotel. Of course, that doesn't happen either. Yeah, I mean, I'm just writing down what I'm thinking, you know, I, I am a... Horny old man, you know, uh, we all are at some point, hopefully, if you're old enough. And if you make it that far. Yeah. yeah, I have these thoughts, you know, most musicians have these thoughts. When I'm on stage, people think like, oh, what is he thinking about? I'm just looking at titties, you know, I'm just looking around the audience, seeing if there's any nice titties. And then if there are, if that lady attached to those titties might be looking at me. <laughs> And yes, she is, and that is amazing, but she's only looking at me. 
because I'm on the stage. Yeah. Maybe my fly is open. Or, yeah. You know when one of the buttons in the middle of your shirt comes undone while you're playing? And the hair. hair you don't notice. Out, belly hair. <laughs> it's just your, your, your gut just sticks out and you don't notice. That's what she's looking at. You moved to the States very young, not to go to school, but just to live in New York. I did really just didn't have any money for school and the whole school. I was very anti school at the time. You know, I went to school a little bit in Cologne mm-hmm. at the the jazz course there at the at the you know the university basically. So yeah, I didn't I didn't even think about it. It's too expensive. So I just came to sit around really just to go to smalls and stuff. Well, right. I mean, if you go to Manhattan or NYU or whatever, and you know pay the crazy money for a a kind of a reason to move to New York, you know, how much are you getting at Smalls and how much are you getting in the classroom? You know, how how much (laughs) of that, how much of that is happening in the community and how much of it is happening in the class? My, one of my early friends was Matt Pemmon Mm -hmm. and roommates, you know, and I kind of tagged onto him a little bit because he was actually going to the new school, I think. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of tagged along and I met a lot of people from the new school through him. And I was always a little bit jealous that, you know, just, just, you know a lot of people when you go. You do meet a lot of great musicians, obviously, you know. And I'm sure you learn something, mm-hmm. you know. I'm just not sure it's worth all that money. I'm not sure. How were you playing? What was your playing like when you moved here? Well, I was basically, I was into Bill Stewart and Jeff Tain Watts, mm-hmm. which is weird. But I basically, I was just trying to copy them. You know, when when you're like a jazz guy in Europe, you're like super weird. You don't notice like, you know, you're like just outcast, weird guy. And so I did like everything wrong for a long time. Like I got the wrong type. I wanted to sound like Bill Stewart, but I bought like the wrong sizes of drum set just because there's no, but there's no tradition. Nobody is like, maybe there's a handful of people but there were a handful of people at the time that could have told me, and now there's many more. But back then, it, was, it wasn't it was like, oh, yeah, if you want this drum sound, you have to buy an 18-inch bass drum and a 12-inch tom-tom and a 14-inch floor tom. That did not, uh, at least I didn't meet that person. So I was playing all this bullshit, and I was playing the weird sticks. I was trying to be ambidextrous. All this shit that's like now, in retrospect, total waste of time, you know? So I came to the States, and I was, you know, I looked like a, crazy you know i had like all punky like blue hair and i look crazy i look like a crazy person <laughs> like a crazy euro trash amsterdam rave dickhead really you know that's what i looked like because why because that's what it was was working for you in germany i, I don't know it's just no it wasn't working but it was just like i was like rebelling a lot you know, as a teenager, I was like really rebelling. And, but somehow, like being a jazz guy and being into jazz was part of that because it's so unpopular, you know, like, and especially I was like more into straight ahead jazz. So it became this like weird outcast thing, you know, <laughs> nobody else was checking out jazz. Last summer, I interviewed Donald Fagan from Steely Dan, and he, uh-huh. he had this idea that jazz and punk are actually very related. What you're describing also, it's kind of reminiscent of that, like in the world where you grew up, the most radical thing you could do and the most outcast kind of antisocial choice would be to be into jazz. Right, and also like the most unpopular choice. If I was doing some like crazy, whatever at the time, you know, like crazy mix up and electronic music and hip hop, blah, blah, blah. It'd at least be like kind of popular, be like, oh, this kid is really cool. But nobody is like, oh, wow, this kid listens to the fucking Wynton Marsalis. Let me, <laughs> let me blow that guy. You know, that's really cutting edge, cool guy. That doesn't happen. So it was weird, you know, and I, I just feel like a lot of Europeans totally like misunderstand the, uh, or at least at the time, I was totally misunderstanding the whole vibe, you know. It's just like slowly when I met like people my age, you know, like or a little bit older that I was already looking up to, like when I met, I don't know, Seamus Blake or, or somebody like that. Yeah, I started realizing that they're way more normal, geeky people than I thought. You know, they're just kind of like, and that kind of you have to be, or like Mark Turner, he's like kind of way more conservative or traditional than, than people think, you know, people think he's this just meditating and, and 
Buddha and, and whatever, you know, but he's, he's pretty much like a hardworking, principled, old-fashioned guy at the core, I think. That was not clear to me, but it's something that, that I now, looking back, appreciate to have learned, you know. If you had misconceptions about what the musicians themselves were like, did you also have misconceptions about what the music was or what the values of the music were? Yeah, possibly. I was, at the time, more still figuring out. So I was, in, in a way, really drawn to, like, you know, straight ahead jazz or like in the early 90s, there was all that renaissance of, of acoustic swinging jazz, you know. Um, I was very much drawn to that. At the same time, I, I did always um, enjoy kind of radical music. Like I'm always checking out some of the fringes of, you know, what music is. Like I, back then I was already a little bit into like really out electronic music or like, you know, it was also the beginning of, of all that like math metal shit. I was kind of into that too a little bit. And so I was also into some really out kind of jazz to some of that sort of knitting factory stuff at mm -hmm. the time and like sort of out free and not necessarily free jazz, you know. Or whatever you would file on the free jazz is yeah. this, you know, atonal, complicated, yeah. you know, music. And I, I still am interested in that stuff, but I've noticed that really when it comes to what I want to play myself, I'm more of a sort of traditional acoustic jazz setting guy, you know. I mean, within that setting, uh, it gets more complicated, but in general, that's the sound I really like. When you got to New York, did you connect with Bill Stewart or Tane? Did you? Yeah, did yeah, yeah. I mean, I was just always hanging around, and and uh, you know, I know those guys. You know, you go, you go to the club, you hang out, you drink. You know, I was probably really annoying young jazz drummer guy asking stupid questions after a gig, but they were both like super nice, and you know, still see them and, and hang out, but. Um, yeah, probably I was exactly that guy I was writing about in the in my books. <laughs> well, that, 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 that's what I'm that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, exactly. You're yeah, the guy. I was totally that guy. I had the craziest accent because I was living with Darren Beckett, who's like Northern Irish, uh -huh. and Penman, who is Kiwi. Yeah. But I had a really shitty German accent, so I I was using all these you know like uh, Commonwealth swear words in a really bad German accent. It must have sounded. That speaks to another aspect of the circle that you sort of landed in. And I've talked to white some, guys, <laughs> white European guys, you know, or white, not only European, but foreign, you know, there, there's a kind of a, it's not entirely that way, but there was right. a kind of a click with, you know, Matt Penman, as you say, who's Kiwi or Orlando Le Fleming, who's British and Lage right. Lund, who's Norwegian, although you, claim apparently that he's Finnish or, or, or Danish <laughs> or, or Saudi Arabian. <laughs> he and, did not like that when I said that one. And on and on. And, and even Seamus, who came from Canada. And, you know, like th that there, yeah. that there's a there's a again, it's not all of that scene, but there's enough of you who are from the same generation and kind of landed in New York from various points on the globe. And it seems to me kind of generated a little bit of a scene in New York. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that was uh, happening before too, you know. But it's, I, I think maybe the European guys coming to New York and being a little bit more closer to what a New York musician would be like has contributed to that, you know. It's, what do you mean? I mean, a lot has changed in the '90s. Like there, I I can't really think of any, not that many, German jazz musicians that come and stuck around are part of the scene, you know, like there, so there's like Johannes Weidenmüller, who was a bass player that came in the late eighties, maybe he's around, he played in like Kenny Warner's trio forever, but I can't really think of like a whole bunch, you know, uh, for Germany, it's a pretty big country, a lot of musicians, a lot of jazz musicians. That's, you know, it's, uh, it's not a whole lot of people, but now I can think of way more you know, that have come recently, and I'm sure that's that's true for 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 other places as well. You know, so many musicians that I know in New York, when they think about leaving New York, the first thing that they say is that they're worried that they won't find a good drummer. 
<laughs> yeah, I heard that too. Yeah. You know, and especially when they talk about going to Europe, you know, for whatever reason, there's that understanding that in New York, the rhythm is just under control, that the drummers are on a level here that is harder to replicate outside of the city. Yeah, I don't know why that is. It's so weird, huh, isn't it? All I can say is it was definitely humbling coming here, you know, like little white Jochen from the suburbs, the German suburbs, trying to come play jazz music. It was a little scary, yeah, pretty scary. How did you find um, jazz? Who turned you on to jazz in the first place? Oh, I had so I come from a pretty musical family. My my older brother is a jazz piano player. And so he's five years older. So when I was a young teenager, you know, he was like practicing a lot. My dad is kind of like a classical guy. He listens to a little bit of jazz, but he's like, uh, you know, play piano and plays organ in church, that kind of thing. Like Bach. He's basically a, a Bach kind of guy. So, yeah, I heard a little bit of jazz from my dad and then a lot from my brother. So it's really my brother that turned me on to it. What were the first gigs that you got when you moved to New York? It took a lot of time, but the first gig I played, I think, was subbing for another German drummer at the Detour. Do you remember Detour? Yeah. And I can't remember who it was with, um, but that's the first gig I played. Uh, out of the kindness of his heart, this other German drummer subbed it up to me. But yeah, it, was, it took a long time to get any work. You know, I was doing that thing where I was a tourist and I had to leave the country every three months. And also I had to make some money and I was not making any money here. So I would go back to Germany and like tour a little bit, dodge the visa. And then this whole time I'd pretend to live in New York. So I had the whole thing with the, remember, oh, so this is even maybe before beepers or maybe it was just when beepers starting happen. You could just have a voicemail. Yeah. And back then it was like, you could have a 718 Brooklyn area called voicemail that you would just, pay $10 for a month. And then I would just check that every day, pretending to be in New York. <laughs> that kind of thing, you know. I would not tell anybody that I'm leaving, you know. I would just, like, leave and then, pretend, like, call back. Like, oh. Yeah, it, it took me, like, a long time. It took, like, two, over a year of living here. And, you know, I was playing, like, a lot of sessions. And somehow I didn't really get a gig for a long time. What year did you move here? What, what year was it? I, so I, I started coming in like 90, I think the first time I came here was 92 or 93. Wow. You know, I was like subletting three months at a time. So I was, I, 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 would, I think the, the first steady apartment I had where I live with Penman was in 94, maybe 95, maybe 95. So I, I would have been 20, let's say 95, I think. Yeah, uh, so, and, and I don't think I had a gig before I moved in with Matt. <laughs> it just started happening. Yeah. But yeah, I play all the shitty small clubs. I played the Detour, the Tea Lounge. There was something called the Cave Haas. <laughs> I don't know that one. <laughs> Do you remember that? No. I played the Blue Water Girl a thousand times. Sure. Oh, yeah. You know, those kind of gigs. The, I think my big, like, moment was when I subbed for somebody at Cleopatra's Needle. Sure. And Drew Gress was on the gig, and he liked my playing. And then he recommended me to Mark Copeland, who had like a steady Monday night thing. He was playing like with Bill Stewart most of the time, and so Bill was getting really busy. And so he kind of needed a last-minute sub, and then they called me. Drew recommended me. Um, I think that's like the first gig, gig where it was like people actually going to the club. And, and he, he, Mark Copeland was kind of like the first like you know American guy who started hiring me so that that was i think my my uh, lucky moment that must have been like 98 or something
So that's a long time. That's like five years. You're in and out of New York paying dues. Yeah, man. Just going that far. I remember just like a bags of CDs, you know, like with cases and shit. Case Logic, fucking 200 CDs and one of those book things. And then like uh, I'd fly my drum set over like piece by piece or have like a snare drum. One, you know, one trip and then a bass drum full of fucking CDs and underwear and, you know, storing it somewhere. It was it was a, a nightmare. And also the the visa thing was a nightmare, you know, just I could have been busted any time. I remember because I, once I started gigging, it was all illegal, too, you know, obviously. So I was like, I do this shit where back in the day we used to have calendars in mm-hmm. paper form and phone books remember that shit oh yeah yeah so i would just put that in an envelope and then mail it to myself and so when i got on the plane i just not have anything they were like what are you doing here it's like i'm just hanging out with my snare drum and my (laughs) underwear (laughs) in case they happen to look in your luggage and see a calendar yeah just chilling that was it was like before websites all that shit you know you would have like at the airport they would literally have to like pick up the village voice and then not find my name because I wouldn't be on gigs that were listed in the void. I mean, I mean, like it wouldn't really be, you wouldn't be able to, to find my name anywhere, you know. Like then maybe later once I started playing some places, you would see, you know, my name in print. But even then, like a, you have to be like a Sherlock Holmes of jazz music at the, at the airport, the immigration guy. I mean, you'd have to know a lot. You'd have to really yeah. want to know because let's yeah. face it, the majority of people in New York immigration or not have no idea what jazz is and where it's happening and who's course, playing yeah. it. So did the people that you were playing with, you know, did they say, cause you weren't going to school, were people saying things to you about your playing? Were you just sort of picking it up? Was it changing? You know, did your playing change your conception change in New York? Did it just continue to develop? I mean, how did those years influence your approach? Yeah, I mean, t- two things happened. A, I just saw like really good musicians yeah. all like on a daily basis. Just, uh, you know, when I got to New York, the Smalls just opened. I uh, fucking, it was like Sam Yehal playing every Wednesday. You know, he'd be playing with Peter Bernstein, mm-hmm. Josh Redman uh, of Blade or Joe Strasser. It's like really good guys. And then Kurt was playing every Tuesday. For his band, there's Thursdays used to be maybe Omer Avital's mm-hmm. band. You know, it's just like great musicians all over the place. Um, and that was all, that's only small. You know? yeah. and Vanguard at the time, I was actually not going so much because it was expensive. Yeah, it's very expensive. And I feel like the Vanguard got like the programming got more interesting in the early 2000s or something. Could that be? I don't know. There was a little change, you know. Maybe. Yeah, it's it's sort of, it, it was just a, a lot of pole motion. Pole motion seemed to be there every like four weeks or something, and then like some older guys that I, frankly, was not familiar with, and actually in a, in a bad way. Like I didn't even go see Barry Harris to like, I don't know, ten years ago or something. I remember just like I was sleeping on a lot of those older guys. Yeah. I could not really afford the Vanguard, and then of course you know Smalls. After a while, if you hang out a little bit and you're friendly, uh, you know, I, I get in for free after a while. So that's yeah. obviously also why I went. Yeah, I remember seeing some of those guys at like Bradley's. So two things happened. You said you saw just a high caliber of playing all right. the time. And then the other thing that happened at this space, I played with some other really good musicians. So that was missing when I was in Germany. Like, that's uh, the, uh, my complaint was always bass players. So once I I moved to the states and I started playing, you know, I played with Penman the first time. I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, that's what it's supposed to feel like, you know. I was practicing that the whole time, was playing along with records, trying to, you know, get my time feel nice. And it just wasn't really happening till I played like with with a really good bass player and a really good whatever, the other 
uh, instruments. Yeah. So that's really what opened the door for me when I, I was like, oh, okay. It's kind of like when you when you go to Italy for the first time and you have pasta and you're like, oh, <laughs> that's what it's, or like Thailand or whatever. You, yep. know, you go somewhere and you- Japan, you, have sushi in Japan. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> I get it now. That's yep. kind of like what it was. And that's not about New York. That's just like, there's a lot of people in New York that can give you that feeling. Yes. That and there's not a lot of people in, or at the time there was not a lot of people in Europe that could give you that. Has that changed? Has the internet changed that? Has the education of the music changed, or the this diffusion of the music? So many people have come to New York and put time in, and then gone back to their respective corners of the planet. Yeah, sure. I mean, travel is easier. You know, it's not that big of a deal anymore to fly to the states. Internet, sure. I, I don't know why it's it would swing into the direction of being more towards New York. I guess because New York is the epicenter of, of jazz. But yeah, in, it, the internet's definitely made it easier. Uh, I wonder even if the coronavirus experience and the, this sort of social isolation of this year is going to reset that even more. I mean, ah, you know, even yeah. you, even you, Jochen, have had to <laughs> embrace it. And, you know, I mean, I think, in fact, we st- sort of started chatting with, at each other when you... <laughs> kind of sheepishly posted something on social media about how you were going to give lessons uh, from home on Ooh. the internet. O- but only only if people really, really wanted. You basically you were <laughs> you like... You know how many uh, requests I got? How many? One single request. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One guy. But it's fine. I fucking... I hate teaching. I can't <laughs> fucking hate it. It's just the same thing over and over. Like, oh, what do you think about? Uh, I'm miserable when I teach. I hate it. But yeah, got to make some money somehow. You know, that's the that's the way right now. I mean, it's interesting to me. Like, what I think stands out about your career. I mean, there are a lot of things that stand out about your career, as you say. German musicians moving to New York, especially in the '90s, there were very few. Those who stayed and became New Yorkers, even fewer. Particularly drummers, because I think European drummers have a bad reputation. They have a reputation for really not swinging. If we're really going to talk about it, I think what happens is, especially the further north you go in Europe, they get this kind of reputation for not valuing swing. And you're a swinging yeah. drummer who you know moved to New York. So right away, you know, Thank you, you. you're kind of an, an, an exceptional story from where you came from. I, I think that thing with the drummer, and rightfully so, man, I still hear so many drummers in Europe that it's, it's just so sad. I don't know what they're doing. Like, it's some basic shit that's missing. We're just like, you want to just jump and shake them and go like, ah, you know, study some older shit before you do whatever the fuck you're doing right now. Because it's not fun to listen to because it's shit is all over the place, you know. And sometimes... It's just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. I'm not talking about swinging or I'm just yeah. talking about like basic, like something that feels good, you know, just getting like a groove right or yeah. a tempo right. It's just a little bit ah, often in European guys. I had a conversation a few years ago with the trombone player, Ryan Keberly, who told me that he had been yeah. getting into the swing feels ride beat swing feels of different drummers and he said like oh i know you know i've really been checking out how like philly joe's swing is very specific and blakey's swing beat is specific and it's true all of those cats had a very identifiable unique way of dotting an eighth note you know and everybody had their own thing but it all felt like it was that same language swinging is a thing it, it is totally a thing that is um Hey, you know how it is. Like, you know, music that comes out these days, there's not a whole lot of swinging music being released these days. And uh, I mean, I don't want to be the guy who's like a the, like swing Nazi guy, but it's um, it's a little sad to me. And I, I miss it often. Like, there's so many albums that come out where it's like, it's a weird thing too, because if you put out an album and like it's all straight eight tunes and all the shit if then all of a sudden there's like a medium walking swing tune on it it's weird you know it's kind of like that token swing tune and then and huh. i get it you want to put out an album that has like a thing and it's it's uh it's a vibe but it's i don't know i miss it sometimes i do I have to be honest okay so that's one aspect of what i think is somewhat startling about your trajectory your life your whole thing then the other i mean there's a few but another one is <laughs> that you pivoted at a 
somewhat unlikely time to being a band leader, putting your own bands together, your own records out, writing your own tunes, and booking your own tours. I think I was just watching other people do it um, with uh, varying degrees of success. When I stopped playing with like Will Vincent's band. Yeah. A lot of those gigs, I feel like we're on the same, uh, you know, level of of exposure or something at the time. And I was like, oh, and I, ba- I mean, I basically just started sort of siphoning off other people's gigs because it's you know you play with Will at this one place, he's not going to play there again for the next two years or whatever the cycle is for a certain place. So that's how I started booking things, and also. You know, having played at so many European clubs so many times before, I, you know, and hopefully having been somewhat of a nice person and not a, t- I mean, I was probably uh, very rude and I can be a dick on the road, you know, as you can tell from my books. Sometimes I get very annoyed and I might just, I might just be really rude to a booking person or, you know, because they can be annoying. They want to talk a lot. One thing that is very clear about you, and I've known this about you through the, Grapevine, and it's clear in the book too, is that you do not want to share a room. You don't want to share a hotel room. <laughs> yeah, who wants to share a room? I need to jerk off when I go to sleep. <laughs> right, I, mean, I know, I understand. Hello, hello. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's one of those those things. I was I I I did play a, a thousand clubs, and I might have also maybe not been so nice to promoters and stuff. But you know, I knew all those people; they knew me, so it was kind of easy in the beginning, and then a, a bit of hit a wall after a few years you know like in the beginning i was like oh shit this is easy you know and then it was also like the euro was like one dollar 42 yeah. cents You're making money in 2011 or something so yeah, you know, play a 1500 euro gig it's fucking like awesome two you grand, know two thousand yeah. dollars yeah you put 10 of those in a row you're good you know yeah you get mark turner his his uh lentils yeah that all kind of went to shit you know like so the euro just tanked it was like that so that's like 35 cents down that's my that's a quarter of the fee you know that's yeah. my fee basically so that tanked and then there's a lot of clubs where like just because it was my first tour like i could book them and so i got all the good clubs on the first tour you know all the better playing clubs and then so yeah, obviously if you play a certain club you can't play it again for typically it's two three years you know so after maybe like 2016, 17, it started getting really hard. I was getting really, really frustrated with booking my own stuff. And I try to work with other agents. And it's just, I don't know. It's, it's just very complicated. Very complicated. I, I see it's very hard to book. I mean, I used to always be mad at agents for all kinds of shit, you know. Yeah. Um, routing. I get it. It's super hard, but often, yeah, I feel like since I'm on the road and I'll be the one who's going to be there, the you know point of other band members bitching at me for having booked a certain thing, you know, I often might make more sensible decisions than a booking agent who's not there, who doesn't have to get up at three and then fly twice to get to the next place and then drive four hours, you know, um, just because it pays two hundred euros more than the other option you know you talk about how you were siphoning gigs off of will's band or whatever you know tours because you realized that he wasn't going to get to play that club again in the next year so maybe you could it's such a subtle thing because basically you have a group of people that are kind of all hiring one another and kind of reformatting it and going back out on the road again it's so tricky man it's so tricky there's no good way of uh, it's just a minefield to navigate it's really hard to book a gig with like two or three of the same people in the band in the same venue. That's the problem. So it just it is the nature of, you know, people playing a lot together that that's going to be a problem. And also in your generation, also having solo projects. I mean, the thing is from and when you think about it, from the point of view of a spectator, from an audience, it's like, okay, 
What's right. the difference? I mean, from your point of view, you're saying, well, the material's different. It's my tunes. It's not Will's tunes. And it's, you know, the, the music is going to be different or whatever. But from the point of view of a right. spectator, like, you're seeing the same cats. Yeah, I can totally, under, I can totally understand. Um, I guess it, it really just comes down to, like, compositions at that point. You know? So let's talk about it. This, so this is, this is a great opportunity to talk about compositions then. What were you looking for? Or what were you thinking about when you started writing? I was recording for that label a lot, which is a German label called Pirouette. And the guy uh, who runs it was like, hey, you know, if you ever want to do something, let me know. And having already put out, I put out an album when I was like 20, which is all standards, all just tunes, you know. So I was like, okay, I, I should write something. And I always wanted to write something. I've already, uh, I was always scared of it. And embarrassed that kind of thing but uh, i'd started programming electronic music a little like maybe three years before that so i gained a little bit of confidence about just huh. being able to put music together that's ha, does something whatever that is i just started kind of studying uh composition a lot i just basically just transcribing my favorite tunes that I wasn't familiar with. And I'm, you know, I'm, as a drummer, I'm not very fast at this. It's a very slow process for me. So um, that's when I started writing just basically, uh, yeah, uh, almost like a, as ex as exercises, you know. Like I did a few exercises that I'm going to use a lot of whatever this type of harmony or I'm going to write something that mostly deals with, with mostly has a rhythmic thing, that kind of thing. Yeah. That's how I started uh, writing tunes. Then some of those were really shitty and some of them were like, oh, okay, this is something that was actually fun to play. You know? But yeah, it's a any jazz composer, it's just, it's just endless fighting in your head over how, how complicated something should be, how, how much improvisation is going to be in there, what's good to improvise over. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's very hard. I was very proud to have written a section that was only like a C minor chord <laughs> uh, for solo on my second record where I was writing music for like a medium swing well, I was going to say was it was it also minor. in four and swinging because if, if you get that far exactly. then you're really making it exactly it was it was just one little solo section things that people shy away from and I, was, I mean I made a point I try to. I just try to make a point of being not scared of going to certain places. I also want to write something really complicated. I, I do enjoy listening to that. But yeah, it's it's hard to balance the whole thing. And I mean, typically I overwrite. You know, write too complicated shit. Like also, like I don't even listen to that much stuff that's that complicated. So why why write it and why play it? Exactly. It's a, it's a very typical mistake composers make. For jazz music, they do, write way more complicated shit than they listen to. Do you think that as a drummer, there's an added layer of what thinking? Well, people know this is a drummer's band, so I need to really be. Yeah, I mean, the, the drummer band has the reputation, especially. I mean, right now it's different. I feel there's been a renaissance of nice drumming composers, but I mean, in the in the past, obviously the the stereotype was like. Like stupid pentatonic, like thirteen eight tune that doesn't have a melody and no interesting chords, and so I think that pendulum has swung all the way to the other side of people. You know, like like Brian Blade's band or something. It's just like not much going on, and it's just like vibe and that kind of thing, and very melodic and almost like a movie score type, like dramatic. Yeah, it's just, just, just there's more um, drummer composers that are known for other things rather than, than that stereotype. No. And for me personally, I think my problem is that I'm just a really shit piano player and I can't play the guitar or anything. So I, my problem is that literally 
I am too slow to play my tunes in time, so they might have too many chords in a fast, like there's too many chords happening. I think you can tell when music's been written on a computer or with the help of a computer. Um, now, when I do write something that's fast, I do, I, I make a point of like first trying to actually write it out and play it, and, and then I might put it in a computer to see if it's, it sounds crazy at, at tempo, just because I cannot physically play it. It's interesting that you say that because you have a whole other project that is completely electronic. And I think personally, your stamp is all over Wolf Parkinson White. White. Yeah. Which Wolf we, Parkinson. we have to talk about. F- Why is it Wolf Parkinson White? Okay. So Wolf Parkinson White is a heart disease uh-huh. that I was born with, actually. Huh. Yeah, it's an innate extra, you can think of it as a, an extra electrical line around your heart. Your heart has a net of electric, a grid of electric wires, basically, that when the impulse to beat is, it contracts the muscle. And there's an extra line where it's literally like a short circuit. It goes in a circle and then your heart gets more impulses to beat than it's able to do. And that's the heart disease I was born with. So what's happening is every now and then it it goes like spastic. Yeah. Like I'll go. The typical thing is like it'll happen every few months or something, and you'll have an attack for like a minute or two minutes, where it's just your heart starts beating really, really fast. It's trying to beat really, really fast, and it's an electrical problem. And I've had surgery to uh, fix it in my early 20s so um i don't know some for some reason i thought it was very funny to pick that name as because it's an electrical voice. problem of the heart and this is your electrical well, it's a, project yeah it's 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 um your electronic associated with like heart spasms it actually feels totally true <laughs> to the music right i mean because what i was going to say is like i i think there's a lot there's like a real sense of humor and a real kind of chaos in the in your electronic music project And it is possible, you know, some people will do an electronic project and it's like, oh yeah, it's, that's kind of the same musical concept as their acoustic project, right. but like they've just added some electronic element to it, or they're kind of like playing in that right. sandbox. But you really, you, you maintain these things as very kind of separate in a lot of ways, like your compositions, you know, the tunes that you wrote for your new record where organ quartet record is like. Mm-hmm. They're just like they're you know they're kind of swinging they're they're out of one. It's just type. jazz too, a little like di- you know it's a little yeah. ditty like trying to make it fun you know. And then the Wolf Parkinson White record, which came out within the same yeah. time, it's like a totally different musical approach. I think you're in there, but like knowing you a little bit and talking to you about what is important to you, I can hear you in both of them, but they're not related musically very much. It, it seems to me. For me, it's almost like there. It's one is music and one is not music. It's almost like they're two different art forms, you know? Like one, like jazz music is, which is so funny because right now jazz music is totally fucked because jazz music needs to happen with a number of people playing at the very same time in the same room, most ideally with an audience, you know? Um, That is very very hard to uh, we're the very last thing that's going to go back to work and corona in a small bar that where everybody's drinking alcohol you know if it's poorly ventilated that's typically where jazz thrives and we're really fucked yep so that's that's the one thing and then the other thing is just me staring at a computer screen for months moving things around and then what comes out is like three minutes of crazy music you know that's my that's kind of how that works so it's like a polar opposite it's it's almost like uh what's the analogy i would it's yeah it's like one is in real time and the other one is not one is like a, a a a play you know like a play and the other thing is like a sculpture or something yeah something that you spend a long time making and and then it goes by really fast it's interesting also like i was thinking about this the latest wolf parkinson white record which i know it took you a long time to to put together you managed to convince a lot of singers to get involved also (laughs) (laughs) and like you know 
Nora Jones and Claire Manchon and Josh Meese and Gabe Kahane crazily. And, you know, all, all of these people show up <laughs> in it, and Becca Stevens. And I wonder what they were hearing when they sang it. The way this happened is like, so, you know, the first few Wolf Parkinson Wright records are like, you know, it's, it's just all electronics. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's no songs necessarily. Every now and then there'll be a you know, chord structure or, or something yeah. resembling a song. Um, and sometimes those things are like very um, on purpose, not there, you know, uh, it's more yeah. abstract. Yeah. Uh, but there's, there's nobody singing in general. So. Um, I all I did a remix for a couple of people of like songs with somebody singing and I was like oh this is actually really fun you know like this sounds great there is a few uh, there's a few my, my big hero is Venetian Snares who's like this this electronic artist There's a couple of old tracks where he has vocals on them. They're actually really good. So um, yeah, I just felt like I, I need to. And then obviously there's there's uh, Bjork, right? Who's always been the the one that has a sort of you know it's kind of like a pop. It's really pop songs with a lot of influence from current yeah. electronic streams. So. What's been That's really w when I was like, oh, I really want to do a record with, with all songs and uh, I can't sing. Um, and I don't really write songs either. Writing lyrics is, is uh, one of the hardest things, really hard. So I just approached um, all these people I know through, I guess, mostly through my jazz, my jazz friends to contribute and... Um, yeah, what ended up on the album is kind of half half of it is like collaboration, uh, as in like uh, some people actually just regard it as kind of like a remix. They would send yeah. me the song, you know, they would like have chords. Like Claire, she just sent me like a finished song, more or less, like her singing and a guitar track. Yeah. And so I then just put it in a weird meter and I just made everything weird. And but, you know, I kind of stuck to the chords. A little bit more or less that yeah. she sent me or uh... couple of songs I actually just wrote, wrote like Nora's song for example because uh, in a way it's weird because she's the like way most famous person on the album but like I have like a very non-musical uh, friendship with her you know we just hang out and I try to not I, I mean I was always thinking oh maybe I should ask her for this but I just don't want to bother her with yeah. shit like that you know um, so in the end I was like okay I can't just ask her to like why don't you write a song. sit down and write a song with fucking lyrics and then I make it all <laughs> crazy, uh, you know, and she has like absolutely nothing to do with this genre. I mean, most of the people uh, on the album have nothing to do with this type of genre of music, like except for Natalie, who is she does some sort of experimental techno kind of stuff. And uh, I guess Gabe Kahane. He, he's probably familiar with with that kind of you know stuff. Yeah. Not that he releases anything like that, but I, I know that he's 
probably familiar with. with well, and Nora, stuff. actually, Nora was on that Wax Poetic record before her. That's yeah. That's why I met her. You know. Uh huh. Like oh really? I was, I was. That's how I know Nora. Like when I was nineteen, twenty, or something. There was the guy that runs New Blue. Ilhan. Ilhan. Yeah, he's the. Uh, <laughs> he's a man that that makes things happen. Yeah, he used to have this band that was basically, he was trying to be like '90s trip hop. That was a thing. And then Nora was. It was just kind of like a, supposed to be a collective thing where he sits at the roads and plays triads um, with like two hands, and then we play funky beats, and then somebody sings soulfully over that, and there's a bit of wiki 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 from a. DJ in the background. That's that was kind of the, the vibe, and yeah. So Nora was doing that for a little bit. Um, you know, she was like nineteen. I was maybe twenty, two, twenty-three. So that, yeah, that's how I met her. I didn't know that you were in part of that project. I did like two tours or something. Yeah, yeah. That's so we I, we tour, I, I toured with Nora and we were just being silly and young and getting drunk and getting into trouble. You know, we went to Turkey a few times. So that's where I know Nora from. And then because she was way more of a jazz singer back then too. You know, like we. So there was a circle of friends that I was part of too. There was so the guy that wrote all the songs on her like hit record. He was friends with my neighbor who I was playing with in like a sort of punk rock band. Jesse Murphy is a sure. bass player. Yep. And Jesse Harris Jesse is Harris the guy who wrote, wrote the all tunes. the songs yep. on, on her record. So they had a little like singer songwriter thing. I was playing with Jesse. So we're all kind of hanging out a lot. I was playing with Sammy Hell. Uh, Nora Jones is taking piano lessons with Sam. He's playing on her album. I played a few gigs with Nora actually just when she was about to get signed, I think. Since she became famous, I haven't really played with her much, but, you know, we hang out every now and then. We take our kids to the playground. You roped in your non-crazy electronic music friends into being part of this project. Exactly. And, like, I was banking on that they trust my musical taste or something that'll like, carry over into this crazy genre that they are totally unfamiliar with. For some, I think some of them are, like, more happy with it. And some of them are just like, what the fuck? But they're like cool enough to just let it ride you know like Nora I think was kind of like okay <laughs> weirdly so I wrote that song and she like liked the lyrics she thought it was like a nice song so she was oh cool I'll do it and then when I sent her the final thing she's like oh it sounds crazy you know but I liked she was cool with it I assume I'll die from The stars down the drain, then. Sounds interesting. Like, you know, they're like, oh, this is interesting, at least. Like, nobody was like, what the fuck did you do to my song? It really, to me, seems like, to, to use the, the, the visual, you know, example, it's like taking a painting that you made of somebody and putting their head on the body of a bear, you know, or something like that. It's like they're so disembodied from their regular musical personas and their regular exactly. musical point of view. Like putting him in a different setting or background or something that still has, uh, it's not even like it still has that beauty of what they're doing, but it like brings it out in a whole different way because it's presented in like, you know, like Nora, like she's done this little thing with like Danger Mouse or something. Yep. That might be a little bit more, than, but like I've never heard her sing this type of music, you know, so like it brings out this whole other. Yeah. Uh, side of of beauty in her in her voice you know like or the like the lyrics are so fucked up and suicidal you don't really hear her sing that kind of shit usually so well no i mean as i said to you yesterday i and it was not a joke i mean i, I listened to the record and then i went and had a salad like i needed i needed <laughs> organic matter and you know healthy matter yeah. like immediately uh, my body started craving something you know <laughs> natural 
Yeah. Because it's not so easy to listen to. I mean, it's very challenging in its own way. It's hard to make it through the whole record. Yes. It, on purpose, you know, like I think when I listen to, because, okay, so I am like an aficionado of this like crazy Venetian electronic snares. music. Yeah, I mean, all kinds of people. And the Venetian snares is the one that got me into it, yeah. you know, and his music can be like all the way from like really, you know, the, there's, there's some that's like more like a ravey, techno, gaba kind of fast drum and bass thing. But it's still very interesting. It's somehow very intellectual as it's always in an op meter. Yeah. You know, and there's a lot of shit happening all the time. There's very few things that repeat, you know, but so it ranges from that and to like maybe a little too much, like want to be aggressive kind of thing to like very far out, very um, detailed, artsy, new music type electronic music, you know. But anyway, there's like a million other artists I I check out, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to stay on top and there's always stuff i i hear that's interesting to me and you and um but yeah a lot of that stuff i can do 30 minutes you know like if i'm really listening intensely you know mm-hmm. there's a few things that are easier to digest like autic or stuff like that that's a little bit more repetitive but it's still kind of out you know that's easier but like the i think if i were to not have programmed my album I would probably be able to listen to seven songs in a row, max. It's funny to me because hearing you describe it, it's not unlike the conversation the jazz musicians have. You know, are we making music that is listenable, fun to play and fun to be listened to? And as the music has gotten more and more complex, especially with it's like all these metric modulations and odd meters and stuff, you know, it's it becomes harder and harder for an to expect an audience is going to be able to go on that ride with you. I mean, I, here's here's the thing. You're you got kids, right? Yep, I've one. Yeah, daughter. Yeah. So I remember being twenty and listening to an album, and then listening to it again. You just listen to it for fifty five minutes, and then you're like, "Oh, that second song was awesome. I'm gonna listen to that again." That has not. I mean, I right now, I I am very lucky if I get to listen to twenty minutes of music. You know, like I have to fight for it. Like I have to. Slash, even in Corona times, like, you know, now we're like drowning in childcare. You know, yeah. There's no school. So I actually do not have, it's weird. It feels like I should be like programming like crazy and finally listening to that, whatever, six hours, mild bootleg that you've had sitting around on your phone and you're going to listen to it on that flight you were going to take, you know? No flights anymore. I I'm not, yeah, I'm not doing any of that. And I just, now notice that like many times I'm forced, you know, like when you're on tour, you're kind of forced to read a book or just listen to a lot of music that I have, that hasn't been around for four months. So I have to really make time to listen to stuff, you know, and uh, as your parents, you know, how, how fleeting that shit is. Like it, now that playgrounds are open. I, I go to the playground, I sit down, I put my headphones in, I maybe get like, nine minutes before yeah. my son comes and needs uh veggie chips you know yeah so it's it's really it's changed so much for me the way i listen to music and i think everybody or at least everybody my age listens to music also the fact that i can can be on the playground and have like almost all the music that exists on my telephone and listen to it yeah that used to not be like that you know? yeah i used to have to go take this subway to a place and then give them money to have the product and then go home and list it and it was not really possible to take it anywhere you know like you'd have to plan to oh, i'm going to take this cd yeah totally or so i can listen so it's changed in so many ways that i really don't know what other people experience but i often have a hard time getting enough in you know but often, also, if I do have 40 minutes on a trip, I don't listen to an entire album. We're going to take a road trip next week. We're going to drive to the Midwest. No way. 16 hours over two days. Ooh. And um, and I said to my wife and my daughter, my daughter is nine. She knows how to use Spotify. I said, everybody's going to make a playlist. Ah. And everybody <laughs> gets to put their music on at some time on this drive. And my daughter said, <laughs> my daughter said, what if we make one big playlist and put it on shuffle? That way everybody's getting there, you know. And I said, yeah, that's a great idea. Because 
what has happened and revealed itself to me during this time is, you know, my daughter's old enough that she has ideas about what she wants to listen to, and they're not always what I want to listen to. And right. she would, what is it, may I ask? She's pop. She loves pop, just straight up pop music, you know? That's good. It's, yeah. it's better than Baby Shark or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, she'll put that on, <laughs> she'll definitely put that on just as a torture device. Like, that's right, just right, a, right. <laughs> um, you know, and she likes Hamilton and she likes musicals. She likes some contemporary right. musicals and she loves Sean Mendez, this pop singer, Sean Mendez. She just thinks he's, uh-huh, he's uh-huh. his greatest, you know. Um, but I discovered some pop, new pop music over the course of the last couple of months that I like and that she likes. And obviously there's always like the Beatles and there's, you know, there's right. Prince or whatever. There's stuff that I've been putting on from the very beginning right. that I like and she likes. But because listening is happening collectively with with the family, it's like, okay, we all have to like make an effort to listen to music together. Right. And it has made me rethink that. There's a lot of things I couldn't put on, you know. I mean, I could, for example, I could put your organ trio record, your organ record on, on, on the playlist. Yeah, you can't, can't put the well, fucking so It would be that. difficult. It would be difficult. Yeah. They get a lot of blowback. I feel like somebody sent me that, exactly that message. I think Lage actually sent me that message. He listened to one song and his, one of his daughters was like, but why is it broken or yeah. something like that? Um, yeah, you know, um, I know what you mean. We are not listening with anybody else ever to anything right now. It's it's really funny. It's I feel very isolated in my electronic music sometimes because I do not know many other people that are into this kind of thing. Hmm. You know, like very very few. It's a very very niche that this kind of stuff. You know, so. Um, you meet them on the internet, and so every now and then, like I get whatever uh, praise or somebody likes what I do, and I notice that there's somebody in that world. Mm-hmm. That's like a big, 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 big um, event for me. But like I, I wouldn't even if if this music was performed, and I would go, I could go to a show. I wouldn't know who to ask to go along. You know. Right. Um, <laughs> Like I wouldn't have, I wouldn't know a single person that I could take to a show like that. Right. So more, you know, more common music. Like I could probably take my wife to like a jazz show, like you know, especially if it's a singer or so, you know, what I mean, like. Um, but I, yeah, I definitely wouldn't be able to take her to that. Or the same thing with my son. Like he, weirdly enough, he was always kind of into the electronic stuff when I would play it. Yeah. Just because it's like so. It's like a cartoon or something. Yeah. So much shit happening. Um, but, you know, he's he's six, so he's not really into anything for more than 36 seconds. Yeah. You know? um, but, yeah, I, I also noticed that I haven't listened to anything that somebody else... Like, I haven't discovered it, like, anything besides, like, through whatever, Facebook recommendations, that kind of thing. Yeah. Which I do actually... It does kind of work there's many things where i've i when i'm doom scrolling through facebook or, or you know, hate scrolling that I, when i see like as much as i hate those like 10 albums a day things every now and then i'm like oh right i forgot about this one or like it's mostly like you know 60s jazz you're like oh I, for, I didn't know there was this album with this guy yeah he plays on that guy's album let me check that out um but like you know new stuff uh, yeah, it's very rare. Like I, you know, now my wife used to put on some what it was kind of R and B and like yeah. Drake or something. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, this is kind of nice, you know. And I listened to that, but um, the the days where it was like, you know, when I had a roommate, when Matt Pemmon was my roommate, and we'd play CDs for each other, those days are certainly over, you know. But the Every way- now and then that happens on the road. You're like, oh, by the way, this is cool. Or I'll ask, like, what are you guys listening to? And they'll give me, like, 10 things, and I'll s- skip through it. And, you know, there'll be more in there that I like. But most of the time, it's just stuff I already know. Right? Even if you already know it, you know, I toured with a saxophone player for a while who, who used to insist that we would listen to music as a band together. And he would say, the right. band has yeah. to listen together because you're then you're... I think he would say something like, you, you know, even just the quarter note is synchronized. Like you've all been listening right. to the same pulse before you went out and played. Oh, huh, interesting. Yeah. And, and it gives you a sense of camaraderie. But, you know, as you describe this thing about like being living in a world where most of your friends don't really know about electronic music or like it, it's kind of like you feel isolated in it. 
it feels somewhat reminiscent to the way you described playing jazz in Cologne. It wasn't a thing that people yeah, knew it's about. Yeah, it's a fringe thing. Thing, yeah. yeah, it's very fringe. True. At your core, you're a fringe guy. You're kind of a fringe guy. I don't know what it is, but like from us, like a discovery, science, kind of scientific yeah. research kind of way, I am into the fringes of music. You know? Yeah, I did spend the other day listening to like an hour of. Do you know there's a whole band camp site now, which is like way too much. But when they started, they just put like a artificial intelligence like they've made this program that'll like re it'll make music uh the, like it'll create music out of whatever you feed it and there is another so this website where they just feed this computer like a week of mashuga uh-huh. you know some like math metal band and then it'll just create its <laughs> own version of it wow in that way and it's so weird man does it sound but like, right? I just listened to that for an hour. It sounds a bit weird because the audio quality is, I guess it's all like grains from the, from the sugar itself. And so now that has expanded to like, I don't know, there's like 40 hours of 40 different bands, but they're all these like weird math rock. There's a math people. metal band called Meshuggah. Oh, you don't know those guys? That's like the original guys. They're just playing. Yeah, it's like metal, metal, like really tuned low. And then everything is in in, in complicated meters. And the guy is just going like death metal screaming. But do you, do you know what Meshuggah means? Meshuggana means Yeah, Meshuggah crazy means crazy in Yiddish. in Yiddish. Yeah, I know. Yeah, this is without the n. It's just uh, no, but it, it doesn't have to have the n. Mashuga, it, uh, it, it can be Yiddish, but I'm looking at it. So mashuga. If this, you play like ten seconds of it, you'll be like, oh, okay. But they must have known that that's what they're Swedish. Yeah, they must have. They must yeah, have yeah, known. Yeah. That's, that's so, kind of super lame if you think about it. It's very <laughs> out there. Oh, no, we make super crazy metal. Let's call Meshuga. <laughs> yeah. You play triplets and seven and the bass drum. That's Meshuga. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so let's talk one. I want to. I want to talk one serious thing about stars and garters. I like this record a lot. Okay, I liked it a lot. Thank you, thank you. I like on your Bandcamp page where you say you recorded it at Brorby's. You say recorded in a facility that also records percussion instruments may contain trace <laughs> amounts of tambourine and cowbell. I like that. I also noticed that you mixed it, and the previous record that you have on Bandcamp. You also recorded it at Michael Brorby's in Brooklyn, and you had James Farber mix it. Then you yeah. gained enough confidence, I'm guessing, through doing the Wolf Parkinson White uh-huh. record that you <laughs> said, I'm going to mix my own Straight Ahead record now. I don't need okay, to so pay I'm, for a day I've at Shelter I've mixed a few jazz records. Yeah. Um, like t- maybe 10 or something. Uh-huh. Oh, so that's I, more than I, a few. I don't think it's that hard, to be honest. Up to a certain level. like There's many jazz records where I'm like, oh, God. You know, I mean, it's like 70% of records I put on, I'm like, oh, God, you know, like the over compressed drums, over compressed bass. That's always one of my pet peeves, you know, and um, I can see how it happens. If it's your own project, you just want everything to be so present and crunchy. Everything's the most important thing in the world, you know. What's really hard to do is to take like cues from from old, old recordings, you know, from the 50s and 60s. Or there, I mean, there's a lot of shit. It's kind of like, yeah, whatever, you know. There's there's a the thing where they like separate it, but not, and then there used to be only like an on and off switch or something. When the drums are trading, you can hear like the piano mic go on and off, that kind of thing. So it's kind of like so crude in a way that it gives you a sense of it doesn't have to be all the way most jazz records are these days. It's like very high. Uh, fidelity and like stereo like everybody is sitting behind the piano and behind the drums and behind the the marimba at the same time and it's like the low notes are way in the left and the high notes way in the right your high head is like i mean actually when you think about it the player's perspective on the drums is like you're not sitting at the drums you're sitting like on the bass drum or you know it's so weird um but it's, it has something i get it it's interesting but anyway, there's there's many other options that are on. So I've 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 mixed a few albums 
kind of trying to emulate a little bit more of the older sound, especially with the panning. And I've watched uh, James do the same. You know, I've I've watched him mix a couple of things, and he very much does does that. He he doesn't really do all that much. He just puts it in a certain space and then leaves it. And he rides the volume a little bit, and that that's about it. You know. It happens in these very simple choices that are actually very strong. They're, the simpler right. they are, the stronger they are. Do you feel any difference playing with a bass player and an organ bass? Organ bass, like the hookup, the yes. feel. It's a whole different thing. Um, I had a really hard time when I first started playing with an organ. Like the bass is almost like it's a centered impulse that comes at you, and it's very defined. You can see the finger if you're next to it you can see that action and the organ is just this more like wider way wider thing that you have to almost like define a little bit more like if i play with an organ trio i have to kind of define the beat a little bit more than when i play with a bass with a bass i feel like often i can like kind of dance around on top of it like skip around and it just carries it and i can kind of mess around the well, organ i feel like that's not the case so much Yeah, it's just a wider beat, and I feel like it explains some of Bill Stewart's drumming perfectly. Like, he doesn't, Bill Stewart does not budge. Like, he is fucking laying it down, and he plays hard. Like, he's like kind of like the, one of the hardest jazz drums. He hits hard, you know, like, it's can't move that shit. And I feel like it works perfectly with organ, just because the bass is so wide and undefined. Also, if you ever noticed, like all that shaping of, of uh, you know, all the dynamics in an organ, it goes for the whole thing. It's not separate, right? So the bass also gets softer when, when they're trying to do a swell or something, you know. It's a very inconsistent, weird fucking thing to play with that you have to kind of, it's more like you have to lay it down and then the organ kind of goes along with it. Yeah. More so than a bass. I feel like if the bass player is killing and swinging, I can just kind of fart around on top of it and it'll still sound swinging and driving. And an organ, not so much. Yeah, I love that, that you say that. And I have talked to a few folks even in these conversations about that what I find to be a little bit the role reversal of bass and drums, not that the bass wasn't always hang, holding it down because it always was. I mean, Paul Chambers was always holding it down, but like somehow in the last 30 years, there is this drum con conception that developed. That's what you described, which is if the bass is hanging on, then the drummer can kind of be commentary as opposed to right. like the, I think the kind of the original, role which was a little bit more like you know, the drums are like everybody needs to get with the drums you know yeah i know i mean it's it's it also i mean switches off you know like i feel like we're going so when i play with a great bass player and it's like you can feel it like it's going back and forth like yeah. sometimes and also that's usually when you see it's working like or you're mm -hmm. attuned to each other so yeah. if i fuck around more the bass player will keep it more simple yeah and if he goes more crazy, I'll keep it more simple, yeah. just to 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 root it, you know. In with the organ, I just I'm just talking about like the general like sound of the bass is just playing along with that bass. Yeah. Especially if it's a walking bass, it is a whole yeah. different feeling than with a bit uh, an acoustic bass. Yeah, totally. I was texting with John Ellis this morning about something else. I told him I was going to talk to you. He just popped back up and said, ask him about playing with Pat Metheny. So I'd like to ask you about <laughs> playing with Pat Metheny. Okay, so I played one gig with Pat. Well, there's two, two interesting things about this. No, four. There's four interesting things. Okay, okay I played with Pat Metheny. He did a tour. Um, I, th I think it might have just been like he was by himself and he was touring Europe and he was picking up bands in 
European cities. Well, are you saying so you're, re- you're 18 years old? You're still back in... No, before- I'm like 20 or something, yeah. maybe. I feel like I'm 20. Um, anyway, I go... Uh, there's this bass player called Martin Wind, who's okay. one of the other... Uh, I forgot him. He's a German bass player who's stuck around here. He's kind of like the straight-ahead guy back then. And he's also lived in New York already. So we both just moved to New York. Somehow, he finagles this gig where we were going to play with Pat Metheny as the local rhythm section that mysteriously also lives in New York, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a festival. So the first thing that happens, so I get this uh, weirdly, it was just like Pat Metheny at AOL.com kind of email address <laughs> <laughs> that I wrote to. And I was like, hey, can you tell me like what, you know, what songs I should learn? And so they sent me, his management sends like a FedEx, like a box is like a huge <laughs> box with every Pat Metheny CD ever recorded. It's like 60 CDs or something. And then there's like two Pat Metheny, like real books in there. And it's just giant box comes. And, and then there, there's a few like uh, post-its in the Pat Metheny book. And, you know, it's just like the, the easier jazzy tunes. So that was the first funny thing. Then the second funny thing is that I did see with my own eyes a... So first off, he was traveling. So he did like a solo set with all his different guitars and shit. Like, and so he was traveling on the bus by himself. Then he had some like kid just with cell phones all around him, just on the phone all the day, like his manager or something. Then he has... Uh, bus driver then he has a front of house guy then he has a monitor person and he has a tick i think is this isn't his wife or something i'm not sure i don't remember confusing that with somebody else whatever so he's traveling with six people on a bus for his solo show and probably a roadie maybe i don't know but i did see a flight case you know like a big flight case uh like a wardrobe flight Mm -hmm. case with like a rod in the middle of the hangers that there was literally like three times three four times the same outfit hanging like the striped shirt the striped shirt yeah the mom jeans and the tennis shoes like just hanging perfectly like (laughs) in a flight case they put that on the airplane but i can't say anything about wigs i don't know Uh, i was actually kind of staring at it well and uh i yeah i think it was just real hair Anyway, it was amazing. He played like an hour and a half solo set. Then yep. he took a break, and then we played another like two and a half hours of trio. Wow. It was insane. It was like a five-hour concert. <laughs> and he was just like, he wouldn't stop. We were just like playing, 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 playing. Um, I was like, wow, this this is, you know, he's like obsessed playing. He just fucking wants to play. It's amazing. Um, and the other funny thing happened that night is like, so afterwards we play an encore or whatever. And then so... This girl that used to be my girlfriend in high school, um, she's at the concert because she lives there. It's a, a jazz Baltica, I think, in the north of, it's like Northern Germany slash Denmark collaboration festival. She comes on stage with flowers. She has one thing of flowers and she, she is, so it's like Pat, Martin and me standing in a row and she's walking up first. She has to walk past Pat and Pat is just kind of like reaching out to like be hugged and get the flowers. And she just kind of walks past him. <laughs> it's like she gives me the flowers. Ah. And it's super awkward. Man. It was so awkward. She didn't even like say hello or shake his hands. I wish somebody uh, had it on tape, but yeah, so that's the funny thing that happened. Um, yeah, no, but it was, oh my God. And so ever since that happened, now every time there's a bio of me, I've played with Pat Maffini. Oh. One single gig. Every time you read yeah. about me and like some not very well researched magazine or something, I'm the guy who's played with Pat Maffini. My favorite is the language has shared the stage with. Sometimes you get that one where it's <laughs> ah, like, that's a good one, you yeah. might not have even done a gig together, but you were on the same festival and you've pu- yeah. you played on the same stage at different times. Yeah. Oh, you were the roadie on that festival. Yeah, exactly. You, put, you worked at the construction company that made that. Stage. Okay, I got more from John while you're talking. This is amazing. Oh, this boy. doesn't happen very often that I get a, oh, like no. an inside back door. Oh, I wish we, we should just rope him into this conversation. Did you have some kind of a fireworks mishap 
when you were a young young child and did it affect your hearing did a firework blow up near your head and affect your hearing yes uh when i was 17 or 18 uh this probes back to the wolf parkins white so i played like a new year's eve party um I, I, yeah, I must have been 17 or 18 uh, in the suburbs of Cologne. And we went outside for, you know, the countdown and the f- fireworks. And this thing rolls up to my foot and I go like, oh, what the fuck is this? It looks like a, I don't know, it looks a little bit like a Harmon mute or something. Mm-hmm. And it just blows up and it turns out to be a flash grenade from the military. Holy shit. Um, so there was two guys from the military there that... Uh, just took some of their flash grenades from from practice and thought it was a good idea to set them off um, outside this amazing party I was playing at. And next thing I remember, I was in, I'm in hospital and um, yeah, I lost my hearing and I had a few like burn marks on my leg. Yeah, I couldn't hear anything for like two days. And so that's actually when they found out that I had the Wolf Parkinson White because they have to give you like a very heavy blood thinning medication for your, uh, basically what happens is from this trauma is like you, the little hair in your ear, they get flattened from the pressure. And so for them to go back to normal, you have to make your blood really thin. Um, so they have to check your heart on on that EKG, they found this uh, Wolf Parkins White condition. Yeah, that's what happened. And then afterwards, there was a whole aftermath was like trying to sue those guys, right? And yeah, it just didn't really pan out. I think the, the verdict, you know, we got to court and there was all this like, well, you're already a drummer. You probably can't hear shit anyway. Did they um, say that at court? That was actually an argument. They were like, are you sure you're your hearing damage is from this flash grenade that exploded next to your foot or from being a drummer. Um, but anyway, the outcome was something really silly that I had to pay like $200 to like a, a, some sort of, I think they gave it to a zoo. Like they had to pay $200 to a zoo. The argument being that animals are scared from fireworks or some bullshit. I didn't get any money. Is your hearing still impacted by it, do you think? No, it's fine. I have a little bit of, um, how do you pronounce this word? Tinnitus? Tinnitus? Yeah, I tinnitus. I, I, I always thought it was tinnitus, but... I, tinnitus. Tin, tinnitus. I have a tiny bit of tinnitus since then. But it's only like, you know, like it's very, very mild. I've been pretty careful since then. Yeah. You, it's interesting that you had to, you sued them. One of the things I read in your, your most recent book is the number of times that you have threatened legal action, taken people to small claims court, or at least used (laughs) sternly worded emails to just either get paid for a tour or get reimbursed for expenses and, you know, like your troubles when flights have been canceled. You know, everybody has been cool and jazz. Like, the, I haven't really gotten fucked over. I got fucked over once by this club in Poland that a lot of people got fucked over by. But, like, so far, everybody's been cool. I did a little bit of pop work, like, in 2010 or something. Those guys are relentlessly shitty. You are worth nothing, and you're totally replaceable, and nobody should ever play with any pop guys for hire. Like, so I played with some guy called Diego Garcia, the shitty singer. He used to play in a band called Elephant. Uh-huh. Um, that was kind of like a grunge band. And now he's trying to be like Latin lover, fucking bongos and, and uh, Argentinian. He's like half Argentinian. And we played all these shitty shows and they were like paid really badly. Everything sucked. Like, it was just everything I hate was, except for... There was always tons of hot chicks yeah. and a little bit of cocaine. <laughs> I saw. There, every now and then somebody would come with a little bit of cocaine and go like, here you go, guys. And then there would be a whole bunch of really hot chicks going, eh. You wrote, that's about it. You wrote this Everything thing, else is horrible. You wrote this thing about going to South by Southwest. and That's the one, yeah. And you um, you say they put you at this, um, this Airbnb like on the outskirts of town. It kind of oh feels God. like it's the projects and you're worried about having your symbols with you. And you said, but fortunately it's a pop gig. So I didn't bring my good symbols. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah. And it was like some really sad amount of money that they were going to pay me like really sad. Yeah. And I had like, they didn't pay me for like a, 
I don't. I can't no, that's what I'm talking about. You and you got a PayPal from the management company a year later. Yeah. Wait, I'm going to ask you one more John Ellis thing. And, okay, okay. And then we'll, and, but this is actually, uh, one of them is serious and one of them is a callback to what we were talking about before. I think you may have undersold your time at New Blue because he says that you had your own wine glass at New Blue at one point. Yeah, the weird thing about New Blue is this. Um, New Blue was a scene. Okay, so, I mean, it was a total scene down there. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. It was just like party time. Okay, this is what happened. I played with... Uh, that band called Wax Poetic for just like two tours. I did like two tours in whatever, 90 something, yeah. seven, eight, 98. Uh, Nora was in the band. And then Ilhan, the guy who runs New Blue, right? Yeah. He, uh, this is before New Blue opened. New Blue opened in like 2000 or something. And then I used to play with Ilhan, the jazz guy, right? He's the guy who owns New Blue, plays tenor saxophone, and he plays jazz tenor saxophone. Yeah. And I played a little bit of him, little gigs here and there. And then New Blue opened, and then he started hiring me to play. I played at New Blue every Friday night. Like, uh, it's really hard to describe it. It's so, it's Ilhan plays on the roads with a lot of delay. Like, he'll play some triads on the roads. And then you'll have a sampler, and every now and then it'll go like that kind of thing. And then he hired Junie Booth. You know who that is? No. Out there. He's like kind of crazy. Yeah. And he is just, he's like a free jazz bass player who will be like out of tune. And he's just like fumbling around on an acoustic bass. Yeah. And then I'm playing house beats. Yeah. Like I'm there playing like four on the floor house beats and I'm fucking around on my computer with all the, you know, electronic stuff. Yeah. And people are like dancing with glow sticks and and doing like yeah. bumps of blow in the bathroom and 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 rubbing MDMA into their clitoris. And then uh, that I did that for like three years. You know, that's when I had my wine glass there, and it was really out because it was like kind of the it was supposed to start at midnight yeah. and go to like three. And it always like I'll get there at midnight and then it would be like. Yeah, we always play like one to four, kind of. Yeah, that's why I never went. I never went to that stuff because it's too late. It's insane, man. It's insane. And then the weird thing is, then I moved. We bought an apartment right next, like literally half a block away from Nubu. And then I stopped playing at Nubu. Somehow it coincided with I didn't really go to, you know, I used to go to Nubu just trying to get laid, do drugs. Smoke cigarettes in the back, that kind of thing. Yeah, it was a scene there, man. I mean, you could hang out after they closed. You just you could be in there all fucking day, like yeah. all night, all day. Um, I did a lot of cocaine in there with a lot of famous people too. It's uh, you know, it was quite the scene. There was that band called the Brazilian Girls. Of course, yeah, Jesse that's, Murphy and, and so Aaron. That's, yeah, that's that was their thing. So they yeah. they've basically made that place famous. Yes. And they they had a gig every Sunday or something. Right. It's just like right, and four in the dark had their their thing there every week. Exactly too, right? that yeah. Wednesdays. Yep. I think they were the last ones to be very successful there. No, I think it's. I mean, I don't know what's happening now with the Corona, but even before Corona, like he opened this other spot that's like even bigger. Yep. Who's the most famous person you did cocaine with at uh, Nubla? Can't say. Yeah, I thought I, th- I thought I'd try. I thought, I, <laughs> thought I'd give it a try. Um, finally, this is the last question from John Ellis. He says, ask him how slash why he's so involved in online education. Wow. Yeah. Cause I hate teaching. Yeah. I think. Like uh, I did this whole thing, like just cause I like having money. So I don't, I don't, I can eat food. I did one of those like I- instructional video course things, you know, now it's all different. Now it has on like Patreon and stuff. So I did that. What was it like putting that together, considering you seem to be a pretty self-taught guy? I mean, it's embarrassing, super embarrassing. I, you know, I don't, nothing tortures me more than having to listen to myself talk. Like, if I have to listen to this podcast, yeah. it's fucking torture because yeah. I'm, you know, stuttering and the uh, 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 and all that and the, the German-ness and the s- 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 all the sounds. It just doesn't sound good. So I, it was very embarrassing because I had to spend hours and hours of editing this with my so I did it with my neighbor, you know all those websites, music masterclass, uh, then that Chinese guy, you know I was gonna do it with them, but then it turned out that my neighbor, who I'm good friends with, is like a professional camera guy, mm-hmm. 
TV, like camera guy. So he was like, hey, why don't you, just, all this looks really shitty. Why don't we do it like and make it no, look nice? And he was kind of like, I want to do it. So I did it with him myself and I sold, I'm selling them like on my website. So there's all the money goes straight to me. Yeah. Um, but initially I just wanted to do it because I was getting sick of teaching and just teaching the same shit over and over and over. Everybody has kind of like 90% of the same problems and I keep just saying the same thing over and over. What are, what Somehow, are, the, what are the problems that people have? Oh, the, yeah. The first biggest problem is the whole like just the time is not solid. Like it, it doesn't feel good, you know. That's the number one problem. And then people don't know what to do to, to solo and they have like maybe slightly too ambitious. They're too ambitious when it comes to like improvising and you know interaction mm -hmm. with other musicians that kind of thing and then there's a lot of stuff too where people just they don't they're sad they, they're either too cocky or they're too shy that kind of thing you know i get those questions a lot in in lessons when they're like what if it doesn't feel good, mm -hmm. but I think it's the bass player's fault ah. or it's the piano, you know? And then you have to be like, well, I don't really know those people, but there are, <laughs> is a good chance that you all suck or maybe just <laughs> one, like, and then I have to tell these stories like, oh, when I play with my favorite bass player, but then this really, really terrible saxophone player plays, it still feels bad. Yeah. You know, one person can ruin the whole party. Yep. <laughs> Those kind of questions I get a lot too. You know. I like that. It's it is possible that you all suck. Um, yeah. No, I think I think it is interesting, and and also that teaching is one of the few semi reliable income streams. I mean, obviously, right now it's like the only thing because there's no gigs, and so like I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. I think it's going to thin the herd. I think that the whole thing is. I think there are going to be less musicians at the end of this. You know, I think they're inevitably we're going to have to be. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, I already see it now. It's kind of weird because, you know, some clubs are opening up in Europe. I see yeah. some of my friends and colleagues online posting about their gigs. But it's all like, you know, outside with like 30 people in attendance. It's going to really, the line between like local guy and person that comes to tour in your country yeah. is going to, uh, just that that divide is going to get bigger and bigger, I think, because right now it's not looking too good for the people that travel to somebody else's country. Well, that's, I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot. I think the local guys are going to, like, this is their time. If you're a jazz musician in Spain, this is a time for you, man. Like, it's you, great, yeah. And I mean, I'm sure a day, I don't know how, I, what is fair, I have no idea, but, you know, being local also probably kind of really sucks often, you know? <laughs> Yeah, and on the other like, I remember being local in Germany and just not getting any love, you know, from the clubs. And then I just remember playing the same club after having moved to the States. I'm like, oh, so now it's fucking free drinks, huh? Jochen <laughs> Rukert. Jo Jochen R R I can't do it. Rukert. R Rukert. I, it's, it is. It's like, the, it's like the cat growl. It's the it's, it's growl. That's like the Hitler. Uh, Austrian oh. uh, now. Rukert. <laughs> did I get anywhere? I didn't did it. I could. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's beautiful. It's good. <laughs> Man, what a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. There he was, my friends, the cool, candid, and occasionally vulgar Jochen Rukert. Anybody get hurt? Did you do your workout while you were listening? I'll be back again soon with another deep dive. Until then, I'll talk to you soon.